This is Five Star Kane Carter here, your Lone Star Wrestling WAW Workhorse Champion, one half of your NCWO Tag Team Champions, and I'm drinking a cold Dos Equis at Moe's right now. Let's get it. All right, everybody, I want to thank Reaper Apparel for having drinking at Moe's be a brand ambassador. They encourage everybody to break out of that comfort zone, live their best self, which, hey, that's what got me starting the podcast. But they got great clothing, great apparel, T-shirts, hoodies, beanies, hats, all that good stuff. Be sure, link will be in the description, and use the code Drinking at Moe's to get ten percent off your order. Let's fucking go! All right, everybody, welcome Drinking at Moe's. Big Mo here. YouTube, as always, like, subscribe, share all that good shit because that YouTube algorithm is a pain in the ass, and I can use all the help. We're most places you can find podcasts. Today, I have with me, I'm excited, we could, we've had to reschedule a couple times, but hey, it's all good. We're here today. Kane yes. Carter, how are you doing? Yes, I'm doing phenomenal. I've been looking forward to this. I don't like having to reschedule and move things around. I'm very anal on time and specifics, man, so yeah. I'm excited to finally do this. Yeah, yeah you know, stuff happens, so I... I know they're one time family and stuff, and I would hope that people would be understanding if stuff with family came up on my end. So, hey, it's all good. Yes, sir. But, I appreciate it. Yeah. First thing I like to start off with everybody with is what got you started as a fan, and then what made you decide to make the leap into the business? Um, so, my stepfather, who took on the role of my father when I was very young, uh, was a huge fan of professional wrestling. So he just passed on that knowledge to me, um, being that he is a white man and I was a black two-year-old or half black, half white, you know, there was a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say confusion as to how to, um, you know, connect with me because I was only two years old whenever he uh, met my mom. But um, wrestling was the thing that he found that uh, grabbed both of our attention. So from two years old, I was watching wrestling with my stepfather, and that was his kind of way of uh, growing a connection with me. That's how I started as a fan. Transitioning into how I actually got started, I'm from a very, very small town, uh, central Texas. Uh, it's called Lake Whitney. Very tiny country as ever. Um, so there's not very many opportunities, but yeah. there was a small company that came and ran a show at our local bar. And I got in contact with those guys and I was like, look, I'm a fan. I love wrestling. There's no way that I can let y'all come to my shithole town and me not, you know, try to help out, you know, come say hey or whatever. And, you know, they were really appreciative of me helping set up the ring i actually worked security for that show for them and then they started training me that's awesome it, you know how how you got in i you know i didn't have anybody really in my family that was a fan i well i had an uncle who has since passed away that remember watching it at his house and i was just hooked seeing the way the crowds would react to certain people coming in I think one of the first ones I vaguely remember was it was either Hogan or Warrior one of the two and I just saw the way the crowd reacted and I'm like this is the coolest shit ever yeah. and I was hooked since I mean there's been those times where you know it kind of waned a little bit but I literally would always watch at some point or another and right. then, yeah, similar, I grew up somewhat small town, 
definitely smaller than Omaha. But that wouldn't take much here in Nebraska. But we never really had any independent wrestling growing up, going through town. And literally growing up, I my graduating class in high school only had nine people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I always joke with people. They're talking about small graduating classes and being like hundred some people. I'm like, I got you beat. Yeah. I dated a girl. Her graduating class had 12 compared to mine or what would have been mine. I got my GED when I was in jail. Uh, my graduating class probably would have had 120, 150, maybe 300 people in the whole high school. But my girl, my ex girlfriend, who was uh, my girlfriend in high school, or whatever, her graduating class had twelve. I and think we started off the year with about eleven or twelve, and then three either either dropped out or transferred somewhere, and then we ended up with nine. And I kid you not, most of the time they would put the graduating class in the gym front in front of everybody. But they put us up on the stage with the administration. There's like, okay, there's so few. You you can just go right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they did their entire graduation in the uh, in their gymnasium. And most of the school was in attendance, even like the younger grades and stuff like that, you know, just to show support. Because whenever you get into small towns that tiny, it's so intimate that everyone yeah. knows everybody. Oh, yep. No, we definitely had a bit of that growing up. And, oh, man, I'm always kind of jealous of some of the people that have on that had small independent shows coming to their towns growing up because I didn't even, and I've mentioned this story before, that I didn't even get started on independent wrestling until I was in the Navy in San Diego, California. And oh, wow. I happened to just google pro wrestling in san diego and then boom one show popped up and then i've had both of the guys that ran that promotion on and handful of guys that have wrestled that i've seen live when i was down there on so kind of was my little start and then i ended up becoming i meet i eh, meet met a guy who has since passed away that ran a promotion up here and then boom here i am now okay okay see it, it took my friend telling me that he saw the flyer at the gas station you know wrestling's coming to lake whitney you yeah, know well I, I know you're a wrestling fan bro we should go check it out and i was like it's not coming here i'll believe it when i see it <laughs> yeah. um, old, i go to the same gas station and i see the sign what's crazy is on that flyer is a kid that I went to school with. No so, kidding. Uh, I didn't know that connection was to be made until the show happened and he was on the show and I met him and how they got to the bar uh, to have that wrestling show is because his family owned the bar. And I also didn't know that. Huh. So I, I went from, I'll believe it when I see it, man, it's not coming to our little small town, whatever, <laughs> to, oh, it's here. Oh, somebody I went to school with is on this show. If he can do it, I know I can. So, that <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. And Texas nowadays, they're kind of having a bit of a hotbed of pro wrestling action all over the state. You know, people often think of like when they think of meccas or like almost back to somewhat of the territory days where like they have the the big stuff going on in like the west coast you know california all over east coast up northeast some down florida midwest i mean more out toward chicago but you know we got our stuff here in omaha and then texas like sprinkled all throughout the state it's got a whole lot of everywhere i know Booker T even runs a promotion out there. And what's it like getting out there? Like, I mean, one, getting out there 
into the independent wrestling world. And two, I mean, getting out there in Texas where, like, I'm sure we've all seen the memes of, you know, those roadway signs where it'll say, like, somewhere in Texas, but then somewhere on the other side of Texas, like, tomorrow instead of miles. What's it like traveling such a big area to get out there? So to put it in comparison, um, you can drive eight to ten hours across Texas and still be in Texas. Um, And that's just one state, right? And so whenever you have one state that's – that it – it's, it's hard to explain. So you got Texas as an entirety, eight to 10 hours, you can get across Texas and still be in Texas. You take that and compare it to the, the Northeast. You drive eight to 10 hours, you could possibly make it from New York to Chicago. And those are two completely different wrestling scenes. Then you can go from Chicago to Atlantic City, completely different wrestling scene. Then you could take from New York to Pennsylvania and it's all in this bubble of uh, eight to ten to twelve hours, but you got Pennsylvania, New York, Atlantic City, Jersey, Chicago, all different places, styles, and companies, and things like that. Yeah, you travel eight to ten hours in Texas, you're still in Texas. So we have our uh, our spurts of variety, but all in all, it's still kind of the same. And I love traveling. Uh, like I said, I come from the country. Um, but I enjoy getting out to see other things. I've lived in Orlando, Florida. I've lived in Colorado. Uh, I've lived on Galveston Island, way down on the beach. Um, I've lived a lot of places in the city, the country, <coughs> beach, mountains, everywhere. Um, so traveling for me, it's, it's a different experience every time. You know, I make it a point to stop at new places, to try new foods out, uh, stop and like sightsee or just look at downtown. <laughs> what wherever I'm going has to offer. Yeah. And it's easy to get caught up in and I got to drop six hours to the show. And as a performer, you drive six hours one way to wrestle for 20 minutes and then drive six hours back. So that's 12 hours on the road for 20 minutes of, of what we train so hard to do. So yeah. I try to find value in, you know, being on the road, um, I use that time to listen to podcasts. I'm a big Talk is Jericho podcast person. Uh, I learn a lot from listening to Jericho. And I know that people like to say this and that about him, but Jericho will go down as one of the best in history, not just for his in-ring style, but for his mentality as an entrepreneur. Oh, definitely. And one thing I definitely like about him and, I've talked about it with a few different people is there are those guys that have been out there that they realize oftentimes when you're having a career like professional wrestling, sometimes, you know, stuff happens. Some careers get cut short, whether it could be whatever reason, but there are those guys like Jericho that, have this weird ability to not like totally reinvent themselves, but, you know, little tweaks here and there that, you know, change it up enough and boom, they just got themselves even that much more longevity. Yeah. 100%. Cause I would much rather see, you know, Chris Jericho go through all these phases and then there's a certain point of his career that, calls for a callback, you know, hence whenever he brought Lionheart back yeah. or the pain maker back in AEW, those are, those are moments that you can just layer on top of each other. And you can be a, a Hulk Hogan or you can be a Sting or a John Cena where your main gimmick and your main stick relatively last the entirety of your career. But what throwbacks and what moments do you have to pinpoint on you know like sting has this 
fucking his moment is like he can no sell stuff and then his moments are his move sets you know john cena's moments are his move sets and his promos hulk hogan's moments was was his move sets and things like that jericho makes moments by giving callbacks and going back to the earlier times in his career and then whenever he did the the mjf uh five stages of whatever to get that championship uh, yep you're bringing back old opponents like moving to guerrero it's those yeah. are little little things that go unvalued to a lot of wrestlers a lot of wrestling fans but i value it because i'm a wrestler and i see the the dedication and the detail that jericho puts in everything that he does and, and you got to think jericho is a performer he helps with the younger talents, sometimes yeah. creative. He has a podcast. He has a band. He has a cruise ship. A cruise ship. This man is the busiest entrepreneur in our business. It, it may be the one of the most busiest entrepreneurs as a as a whole. You know. True. So, yeah, he's I, I a little him. bit of everywhere. Yeah, no, he he's a little bit of everywhere, definitely, and like. I remember a little funny note with the cruise ship. They now have, I think they're getting ready for their fifth one. And I've talked with somebody that has, I think, been on all of them to date. And they remember telling me that for the fifth one, they felt like they missed the boat on naming it Cinco de Jericho. And it's like, okay, I, I, I can I can see it. I feel like that's kind of forcing the narrative. That you know what? I can see that point too. Yeah. Like I can see the the novelty behind naming it something like that, you know, for the yeah. fifth one. But then your point of view there, I I can I can see that too kind of very cliche and at that moment like are you are you pushing that because you like it or or what i mean yeah. like no nope, i i can see that well one promotion that i'll i'll admit maybe i'm not too familiar with it because you know me being up here and not completely having the funds to travel to as many shows as I might like to. They're, the promotion that I've seen promoted on your page a lot, Hot Pro Wrestling, I'm like, there's some stuff on there that I'm like, okay, this looks interesting. Yeah. I actually worked with Hot uh, last night in uh, Austin, Texas. It was that Come and Take It Live, and it was the Jason Silver Invitational, or Jason Silver Memorial Invitational Tournament. And, uh, Jason Silver is a wrestler who wrestled for Hot, and he uh, he passed. And I had the pleasure of meeting Jason once. So you know, me being on this show felt like I didn't deserve it. Um, but I had talked to Jason's best friend in the business. His name is Sky Della Cremosa. Great guy, great gimmick. His gimmick is the Texas Chainsaw. So he comes out oh. and like. A, a long apron with the chains and the leather. It's kind of a leather face gimmick. It. It's awesome. Um, but I talked to him and Jason said that Sky liked me and he really want, or he said that, sorry, I, I, I don't know what I just said. I talked to Sky, Jason's best friend, and Sky said that Jason liked me and wanted to work with me in the future. So it gave me some clarity on working with him last night. Um, but hot is a phenomenal promotion run by uh, a great promoter. Um, he's, he's, he takes care of me. You know, he puts me in stories, which I value. I've got yeah. good quality matches working with hot, you know, and pay is right. You know, every time um, overall good quality promotion. And, and what they do is they travel to different uh, areas of central Texas Um and, you know, sometimes you can lose wind by traveling to places that aren't too familiar, especially if you hit like a small town and yeah, comes out. But, you know, they then go to Austin and then 
Waco, Texas, and I, I can't just I can't put hot pro wrestling over enough. I love it. I've had uh, phenomenal matches there. My first ever hardcore match was with Hot. Great promotion. Great promotion. I, I was gonna say, I've I've loved seeing the different promotional stuff on your your page and the hardcore match you're t- talking about. Correct me if I'm wrong. Weren't you you were in the hardcore title match there, like? I, oh, I'm forgetting the date on it at the moment. But you, Two weeks ago. Okay, okay. I, I was going to say, I could have sworn I saw that on there. How did how did that go? That was phenomenal. I was uh, visibly nervous as hell. Uh, wrestlers in the back were, were coming up to me and, you know, trying to ask if I was okay. Uh, some of the fans even said when I made my entrance – they could visibly just tell on my face that I was nervous. But once we got the ball rolling, um, I was wrestling Matt Locke, who is Hot Pro Wrestling's hardcore champion. And um, he's he's a phenomenal hardcore wrestler, phenomenal wrestler all around. Um, I would not have put myself in a position to challenge for a hardcore title and a hardcore match if I was not getting to wrestle Matt Locke or one other name who I may or may not want to say because ever since I've said that I would take him on also, he's been pushing for another hardcore match. Um, Hmm. Great, great guys though, you know, (laughs) but I told myself, you know, it's got to be those two. It's ever a hardcore match. So whenever I got the chance to go after that title, I went after it full fledged. Um, I, uh, I had the great pleasure of being slammed into thumbtacks for the very first time. Oh boy, yeah, that that can that can get kind of messy. Yeah, man, but we were, we we beat the crap out of each other. You know, uh, I hit him with a, a baseball bat with thumbtacks. He put me through a guardrail, more thumbtacks. It, uh, it was everything I asked for. It was in a compact building. Fans were close. It was very intimate. My mom was there. A lot of my wrestling fans from other companies came and watched that sh- that match, and uh, they said it was match of the night. And that's kind hey. of a, a kind of a repeating scenario for me, working hey. very. Tough. All right, yeah, I me, mean, I'm kind of a fan of that intense hardcore style. I know, I went to a show out in Des Moines, Iowa, for Sammy Callahan's promotion, Wrestling Revolver. And oh, he's a revolver. Yeah, and no he that night they had. I didn't realize these two matches were going to be back to back, but looking back on it, it kind of makes sense. But there was a monsters ball match featuring, and I can't remember everybody, but I can remember a few of them. One was Warhorse. Okay. One was PCO. Jesus Christ. Okay. And another was Madman Fulton. Okay. And it was insane. At the end of the match, they had, you know, thumbtacks, barbed wire shit on different sides of the ring, just all over. They were getting ready to clean it up. And then the next match, I guess, ended up being a death match between Jake Crist and Joel Bateman. And okay. they they were trying to clean it up, but here comes Jake Crist running in. Thumbtacks all over. He's like, fuck this, leave it, let's go. And then boom, <laughs> they just left all that mess all over the place. And yeah, it, it was insane. And one, one of the craziest moments I've ever personally in person witness was during that match, which I'll go into that a little later because I I have two categories that I like to round off the show with, but we'll get into that okay. in a little bit. But you mentioned before we recorded that it has been about a year, maybe a little more, since your last 
podcast interview. And that got me thinking because it's like a lot can happen in a year. Let me tell you. some, Some of the stuff that's happened during that time. You said what? What's some of the stuff that's happened in that time? Because, I mean, I know I've had a crazy enough year, my, my wife and me, but what's some of the stuff that's happened with you within that last year? Well, if to you start don't off, mind sharing it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, to start off, whenever I recorded that podcast, I was homeless. I was living in Austin. I was uh, training at a training school and sleeping in the locker room. Uh, I had all my belongings in my truck, so I would go to the wrestling school at night, you know, sleep there, wake up in the morning, lock it up, and go on about my day. Um, that was the last time I did a podcast, but since then, um, I had moved back to my hometown. Um, I had joined another training school, uh, MPX. It's Metroplex Wrestling. It's run by Athena and her mm-hmm. husband, Pat Palmer. I've I've heard I've heard of that one. A couple of different people. Great company. They run weekly, and so once I can get my foot in there and establish some storylines, uh, we can get the ball rolling on that. Um, but no, uh, just in the last year, man, I, I've tried to work with as many companies as I can. I've made plenty of debuts. Um, I have I have earned the. Uh, NCWO Tag Team Championship with my partner, John, one half of KOA. Okay. I have earned the WAW Workhorse Championship wrestling for uh, Lone Star Wrestling WAW out of Waco, Texas. All right. Like a home promotion for me, man. Training, living life. Uh, I've wrestled in Alabama, Oklahoma since then. Um, just continue with grind, man. Uh, yeah. No, professional wrestling, especially independent wrestling, can be a bit of that grind. And you mentioned one of those tag tiles with uh, Debbie on there. I remember talking with him about, I want to say it was shortly before we recorded when AEW was in, ta- was in Texas. I forget where. But then... Yeah. I saw somebody post it, like, the look of the entrance there, and there was a certain tag title that was in the picture, and I'm wanting to say it was that one that you were showing there. That one right there, yeah. So that was something. Bad Boy was on AEW TV. Um, The promoter for NCWO in Oklahoma was very grateful and – very high on that um, on that action, you know. Uh, I just took it with me as a champion. You got to represent the company that wants, you know, you to be the face of whatever division, and it being the tag division for me, I got I got to represent proudly. You know, this oh, is my cool. life. This is what I do. So taking it to a wrestling show wasn't. It wasn't far-fetched for me, but when everyone started going crazy about it, oh, I seen the belt on TV and this and this and that. And I even had some people uh, comment and say that, oh, you think you're a big shot just because you took a belt to a wrestling show. And like, no, I don't think I'm a big shot. I think I'm doing justice of, of all the hard work and the trust that this guy is putting into me as a champion to value his championship belt. Now, granted, I didn't go out there and make the post, you know, Yeah. somebody else saw it and made the post. So yeah. I was just riding the, uh, riding the momentum that the post was getting. And, you know, some people took it the wrong way, you know, and that promoter stepped up to my defense, you know, and he's very grateful. So oh, yeah. uh, shortly after that, I won the workhorse championship. So uh, next time AEW comes to town, be on the lookout. I'll be, Double champ in the crowd. Hey, that would be something. I know I've only ever had the chance to go to one AEW show, and that was in Kansas City, Missouri, because for some reason, even though people up here in Omaha have been clamoring for a while for an AEW show, 
The closest they've ever come is Kansas City. Oh, wow. Maybe outside of that, it's either been St. Louis or Chicago. Okay. And a friend of mine, his wife was planning on getting him tickets for the last one for his birthday and was like, hey, I know you and him like wrestling. Would you want to go? I'm like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't want to miss that. (laughs) So we went and it was the, I'm trying to remember. It was the night of the Vikingo versus Kenny Omega match. No, no, actually. Um, no, the, uh, I came. Uh, the wait, oh, you you saw the Vikingo versus Omega match? Yeah. I thought okay. I thought you were asking about me. Okay. No, whatever. no. What, what, I'm trying to remember what was the, one of the big ones there because it was a pretty decent episode from what I remember. Union of the Elite. Whenever Hangman rejoined the Elite. Ah, yes, yes. yes. I remember I that to, night. I got to watch that whole ending of the episode scramble. Uh, Hangman rejoined the Elite. I was overly excited to see Kenny Omega because he's my favorite wrestler. And then Rampage following, um, as many of my fans know, I am a graduate of the Dustin Rhodes Wrestling Academy, the RWA. And Dustin Rhodes had a match on Rampage against, uh, I can't remember who, but he ended up getting bloody and had a good match on Rampage, so I got to see the reunion of the Elite. I got to see my coach. I got scissored by Anthony uh, Bowen. I, yes. Oh, uh, my God. I got to was- see them. I think the Rampage that I went to was actually them versus the Kingdom. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I got to see them. I wasn't anywhere close to actually – scissor either one of them but it was pretty cool finally getting to see those guys live yeah yeah they're great they're great uh i got to talk to max caster very briefly whenever i wrestled for AEW. uh you know he was excited to see a bunch of the new guys getting brought in um and that's whenever it uh to get on AEW dark was a big accomplishment and i'm not saying it's not an accomplishment now but they have made it a point to whenever they go to different cities, they will reach out on the independents and get some hot indie guys to put over their talents. Um, I actually got flown out by AEW on behalf of Cody. It wasn't because I was at the Rhodes Wrestling Academy. Yes, that ties in. But what happened is Cody was going into match three of his match his matches with malachi black whenever malachi first came to aew they had that three match sequence going into match three cody used dustin's training facility for a promo and in that promo uh red velvet slapped him he wrestled around the ring with uh it was sean dean captain sean dean it was brock anderson uh, Lee Johnson, me, and then this guy from Scotland, his name is Paul Hubris. Um, we were handpicked by Dustin to get in there and roll around with Cody. Um, to show Cody's gratitude, he's the one that was like, hey, you know, get these guys in check, like get their stuff ready. We need to fly them out to Universal. And that's Universal Studios where they yeah. were a lot of the dark episodes. Yeah. At the very beginning. So I was on one of the beginning dark episodes when they were at Universal on behalf of Cody uh, to show his gratitude for us, you know, rolling around in the ring with him. It was like a whole thing. The production team was there. It's very professional. Um, I got flown out uh, where I met Kid Bandit for the first time. That's how awesome. I. Uh, I wouldn't say a close relationship with Kid Bandit, but he knows who I am and he's very familiar with me. Um, just overall great experience. I got to meet a lot of people I looked up to getting flown out. Um, so it just all ties in, man. And that was very great for that opportunity. Don't oh, know yeah. how to run off into that, but. Uh, no, nah, no, it's all good. You know, we kind of got into a little talk about AEW, so I can kind of see how that kind of filtered in there. In, 
hey, I, I love hearing about that stuff. Now, what is next for you? Because, I mean, you got the workhorse title. You got that tag title. Where, what are some of the things you got coming up? Because the, the episode might come out after some of these things, but I can always, we can always mention it in there. So uh, I have my first ever workhorse championship title defense scheduled against Chandler Hopkins. Um, going back to, I said Red Velvet's name earlier. Uh, it's, it's Red Velvet's boyfriend, I, I think. Uh, they're a couple, and he is a hot name in Texas, a great athlete, great wrestler. Um, he was actually on my five independent wrestling dream matches of 2022. So, so that was my first workhorse title defense against Chandler Hopkins is big for me. I am booked for the Texas Indie Showcase. And what that is, is um, it, it, this is the third Texas Indie Showcase. Uh, a few independent wrestling companies from Texas all get together to showcase their talents all in one show. I think for the third Indie Showcase this time, I think there's eight or nine companies, all partners together. The one last year, there was 10 companies. And I told myself, you know, that would be a cool thing to get on. I'm seeing all my favorites, you know, 10 companies are coming in together to work for one show. Fast forward a year later, I have that coming up. Um, on that card is Kid Bandit and Rocky Romero from New Japan. Oh, okay. Brian Keith, who's killing it all across the nation right now. He Texas, so that's a it's a big car that I'll be on again. It's the Texas Indie Showcase. If anybody wants to check it out, it will be streaming live on IWTV. Um, but other than that, man, I just want I want bigger names, bigger talents to show that I can run the best of them. I'm looking to travel more out of state. I've been trying to reach out to companies in Louisiana, Alabama, um, just anywhere that I could venture off to. You know. I, I'm never a person to settle, so I always want more, and more is what I work towards. Hey, sometimes when you start settling, that's when things start going a little downhill. So when you're always wanting more, you're always wanting better, I mean, then, boom, you're, you're on to good things. 100%. And sometimes that's my, uh, my worst aspect is that I'm my own worst critic, uh, and uh, yeah. I want better for myself, and sometimes I don't appreciate what I have, you know. Um, I am a double champion with my partner, Devion. We're both double champions. He has a singles title as well. I am wrestling in a lot of major Texas promotions. Uh, there's still a few that I have yet to tap into, but I know that the promoters of those companies know of me, you know, just through talks on the independent scene. I know these guys know who I am, but it's just, it's all about right timing, right show, you know, getting me yeah. in there, right opponent, you know, so yeah. uh, sometimes it's a blessing and a curse to always want more because sometimes I don't value all the accolades <laughs> that I, I've gotten in this business. No, I can, I can totally understand you there, especially the part about being your own worst critic because I'm definitely that even with regards to the podcast like i've gotten a lot of great feedback and i love it because sometimes some of the in between like i love in the middle of recording like with you but some of the in between trying to get people or people sometimes flaking on you so that that in between stuff can be kind of chaotic and them there's also the fact of me being my own worst critic that I have yet to actually watch back any of my episodes other than during the editing process. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, just like, I don't know what it is, but I just, I haven't done it. I've learned not to watch my matches back to nitpick um, because I'll sit there and nitpick everything. You know, yeah. I, I make it a point. And this is anybody else wanting to get into the business. Um, make it a point to ask the vets what you can improve on. Don't go to the bag and be like, 
hey man did you see that match was it cool you know did you see my dive i finally learned how to dive i hit a 450 splash but, uh, anybody anybody can do the physical stuff yes yeah. uh it's the it's the initiative that you take to ask people what you can do better that gets you further along and gets you more respect in the shows that you want to grow. So I've made it a point not to nitpick myself because I'll just pick apart everything. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I ask vets to tell me, you know, what can I improve on? And I take their advice. And if they don't point out something that I kind of thought was shitty or something like that, I, I just talk to the game. You know, maybe if the vet that was watching my match didn't see it, then I know for a fact the fan who's not, who doesn't know the ins and outs of wrestling, he's not going to notice that either. So. Yeah, and, and sometimes I can imagine with that that while it might be hard to not nitpick, if you're not letting somebody in the crowd know that, oh, then – maybe they won't catch on, but the moment you let them know, then they'll look back on it and be like, oh, I, I see what they're talking about there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, I mentioned I have two categories that I kind of like to round off the show with. One's okay. a bit of a name game, and sometimes I try to theme it towards the guests, and I kind of did this a little bit with Demian, so I figured, you know what, some of them might be the same, but we're going to go with some guys that made Texas wrestling famous, or guys guys that are still in that have come from the great state of Texas. Love it, love it. First one, a guy that I've actually had the pleasure of getting to meet once, Keith Lee. Keith Lee. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is uh, a great talent for uh, the adversities he's been put with. Uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure about his age. I don't know how old on the spectrum he is, but he's rocking that gray beard now. You know. So, <laughs> yeah. um, hey, he looks good with it. I, I gotta say does so for whatever age he's sitting at uh his size uh and just people doubting him and his lack of character ability uh i, I see through all that i think yeah. he's phenomenal for his age size and all the adversity that he's been thrown into he, he's oh, yeah. gone far above and beyond all that oh totally and you know i actually talked with uh little bit with uh, Rich Swan, not for the podcast, but I met him the same night that I met Keith Lee and we, somebody got to talking about him. I'm like, you know what? I, I, I get it. He's a perfect example of somebody that could be like, you know what? Let's say how it's been kind of rumored WWE wanted him to kind of slim down similar to how Gunther has. And he didn't think he needed to, which, hey, I personally didn't think he really needed to. But he's a perfect example of betting on yourself, knowing that, hey, I don't think I need to do this. Going to AEW and doing some of the stuff that he's been able to do there. And I also like that he reminds me of some of the classic big guys that it's like, those big guys that move in a way you wouldn't expect a big guy to do. Yep. Exactly. Like some of the stuff he can pull off the power moves, but then he can drop pull off down, some high, drop, high flying stuff. Yeah. Drop down leapfrog international spot. Just like with the best of them. Oh yeah. It's amazing watching it. it. Nice, nice dude on top of it. Like got nothing but good things to say about him. Next up. Mark Henry. Mark Henry, my childhood. Um, honestly, wasn't the biggest fan of him growing up. I wasn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't care for his world's strongest man stick. Um, 
because I was a fan of the world's strongest man uh, competitions. Yeah. And, um, I, I always like just being young, I always thought, well, if somebody won the say 2005 world's strongest man competition, you can't call yourself the world's strongest man. That, it was just a concept that I didn't understand. Yeah. So uh, it, it just kind of turned me off to him. But uh, he's another one that has just lasted through all the adversities. I didn't know he had been wrestling for as long as he had. He, you know what? Thinking back on it, yeah, it's kind of crazy thinking how long his career has actually been. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's been a long one. And then people always with him still think of that time where he kind of joked everybody into thinking he was going to retire and then goes on to that uh, Hall of Pain run that he had, which that was some. Yeah, see, I, I wasn't watching wrestling at that time, so I didn't, I didn't see all that, but it's definitely a moment I've revisited and, and watched and great, great segment at that. I, I don't think of another Mark Henry moment that tops that. So, uh, yeah, I can I can get that. Next up, the one, the only Booker T. Booker, uh, future Booker of Kane Carter. Hey, because so, uh, I will wrestle for Reality of Wrestling. Um, from what I've told, man, you just got to look real professional and have your P's and Q's in order to work for Booker. And I know that him being Booker T, there's probably a revolving door of people that want to come in. So it's just a matter yeah. of time. A matter of time. No, I, I can I can definitely see him as being a, one of those types that he definitely has his way he wants things to look so yeah and good lord with a name and a legacy such as his i can only imagine like you said the amount of people that wanting to go through reality of wrestling's doors has got to be insane yeah, yeah. next last but oh shit uh -oh. there we go all right we're back my phone got an alert and I have it on vibrate and it wanted to fall so there we go anyways last but not least as I was saying before I got interrupted there one of my personal all-time favorites and probably the only celebrity I can think of that would legit get me so starstruck that I don't think I would be able to get a word out if I ever met them I know who you're gonna say Stone Cold Steve Austin 100%. Um, again, one of the, I, I'll agree, one one of the few people that if I ever saw him, I wouldn't know what to say. Um, we're both from Texas. Believe it or not, I'm country. I am country as shit. Uh, so I feel like me and Austin could just sit down and bullshit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> not, not bump asses about being from Texas in the country, but you know, like his like rough and tough, no nonsense, don't give a shit attitude. That's it's Texas. That's me too, you know. So uh, I I would love to just sit down and, and talk with that man. Wrestling, if wrestling comes up, then wrestling comes yeah. up. But yeah, you know, I would just like to sit and just talk with that man. Oh man, I I tell you what, man, that. The, the mentality that you mentioned there, that's very much anybody that knows me knows I'm pretty much like that myself. So that makes me feel somewhat better about the potential, whatever it might be of getting to meet him. But yeah, no, he, just to sit down and talk to that guy, like I have joked about this, but I could very well see myself doing it that if I ever somehow lucked out and got to have him on the the podcast that I could never do another one and I would be just as fine like oh, yeah. how am I gonna top that exactly, exactly. next up I have 
a random question category. Some might be wrestling related. Some might not be. You just answer how you see fit. Right, hit me. First one, one of the only ones that I legit make sure I have on here every single time. Craziest in-match moment for you. Um, the, the opponent that I wrestled is not going to like me speaking on this. <laughs> um, it, it was a scary moment. Crazy and scary. Um, I was in Uvalde, Texas. And if that strikes you familiar, it's because they, uh, they had a mass shooting. One of yeah. the big mass shootings in history. Uh, the yeah. biggest in America, I believe, where kids, yeah. the kids were the victims. Yeah. Uh, a few months after that was the 4th of July town. And there was a, there was a four, the 4th of July holiday. And in the town, uh, the community got together and uh, they just had a big township 4th of July celebration. You know, on some parts of town, they were at the park. Um, on the other side of town, there was like a flea market thing going on with the wrestling show. Okay. It, it was at their rodeo arena. And if you can envision a rodeo arena, you know, it's dirt and gravel where horses and animals are just compacted. <clears throat> rock and gravel down yeah right so just to give you a visual um i go to do a fosbury flop and for anybody that doesn't know what that is it's a dive to the outside where you're running straight but in the process you turn and you do a backflip ah uh, i i vaguely um, can remember seeing some people do that neville yeah. neville at a uh, pot he does it and he does a flawless Fosbury flop. Um, I have that move in my repertoire. So I went to do this move on the guy that I was wrestling and his manager, who are both 250 plus pounds, right? Pushing big men sizes, who should be able to 100% catch me and protect me. Yeah. Being that I'm only a buck 65 at the time you know so uh i go to do my fosbury flop uh in the process of the move on impact they didn't fall oh no so on impact i'm upside down and i bounce off of them and nosedive straight into the ground all into the gravel forehead nose cheek chin <laughs> scraped up bloody Ooh. um it was I don't, I, like you know whenever you scorpion and you like he, he, yeah yeah you can flip, he touched yeah. Your neck. yeah it, it was it was bad it was very scary uh but it drew me a lot of sympathy with the crowd because as soon as i got up my face was bloody and, uh scabbed up and they could just see it so we finished the match uh, i won and i got one of the biggest pops to date at the time. Uh, and it was in Uvalde. Like I said, they just went through that uh, horrible, horrible massacre. Um, but I had children running up to me and like hugging me, you know, and in and, and a vulnerable time where they just had to witness something yeah. so horrible, you know, for kids to run up and hug me and give them a sense of comfort. Um, that, that just in entirety, you know, fucking up my, excuse my language. I'm no, no, hey, you're, you're good. You're good. Messing up my face was the crazy moment of it, but it, it did pay off you know, because I gave those kids a moment away from what they were going through. And that, that top a lot of my wrestling moments that I'll ever have. Oh, no, I can imagine you're having the crazy moment of, you know, getting your face beat up like that but then it leaned to a rather heartwarming moment of getting to provide that for those kids that had just been through something unimaginable oh, definitely uh, if you go crazy my... and meaningful all in one yeah and if you go to my uh, facebook page the video of me winning and those kids running up to me it, it's pinned on my facebook page so anybody that wants to see that moment um 
if if you would, you know, it's on my Facebook and it's the first thing you see. And I have made it a point to keep that pinned on my Facebook because it meant so much to me. Oh, definitely. I can understand why. And I'll definitely be checking that one out. Now, we kind of mentioned that, uh, you know, Texas and with it taking undemand, like, good Lord, eight hours sometimes and you're still in the state. I know eight hours and I'm up in like Fargo from here. <laughs> but what would you say are some must have road trip supplies? Take away, you know, the obvious, like, you know, you're traveling for wrestling, so your your ring gear and that sort of thing. Um, I'm a smoker, so I got to have my essential uh, smoking pack with me. Um, uh, something to entertain you, whether it be, you know, a podcast or a good musical playlist. Um, depending on the amount of times you can stop or whatever time crunch you have snacks and energy drink, obviously. Um, I'm very big on, you know, my body. So I always have to pack or plan to stop and eat on the road. Um, I mean, whatever can keep you occupied for eight hours or Mm. however however long you have, you know, gotcha. My thing is, you know, I got my smoking pack. So every now and then, you know, I'll light up a smoke, uh, turn on a good podcast and uh, just cruise. I value, like I said, at the beginning of the podcast, I do value uh, the sites of wherever I'm going. So I don't I don't need too much internal yeah. to uh, get me by if I can, you know, get a podcast going, a good vibe, you know, just to see, you know, where I'm at. Uh live in the moment you know we're so consumed by technology and yeah i I fall victim of being on my phone way more than i should have (laughs) the way so just uh learning to value being on the road you know Mm because a lot of people they go to work 20 minutes to an hour away from their home come right back and it's not even a job that they like so, I mean, I, I, I just value being on the road, you know, stopping and seeing some places, trying a new restaurant. Mm-hmm. That's essential for me. And it's not bringing oh. any, it's, it's the moments. I can, I can understand that. I know whenever I get the chance to travel, I'm always liking to try different places that I don't like to go to like the, the big chain stuff. I like, like, I want to find some places like, okay, where would you ask like a local to wherever you're at? Hey, what's a good spot to eat here? Or yeah. something like that. Something that you wouldn't get where you, where you live. So getting that experience, I can totally understand you there. Oh, let me... All right, everybody, we had a little technical difficulty. Phone overheating, you know how that stuff goes. But phone got blistering hot and told me to cool it down. Gang Carter, help me, is what it was saying. So, sorry, guys. It's my fault. fault. Yeah. No, I've definitely had that happen, actually. Oh, boy, I'm trying to remember. That's happened to me a couple times, but I remember one time in particular it was actually with uh the promoter of warrior wrestling out of chicago and first time all of a sudden like part way through the dang interview all of a sudden that same miller phone over here and i'm like damn it (laughs) but we got it going so and he's actually him and the whole crew at warrior has been Pretty good friends after everything. I got invited to their St. Louis stop, so it was hey. got to see got to see uh, oh, what was a couple of them. I got to see it was Jeff Cobb versus the guy going back by Bronson Reed now. Okay. Okay. And yeah, those two guys, I was so close that when those 
two dudes chopped each other so hard you could see little individual beads of sweat flying off of them. Yes, it was. It was something. And you know what? Something that I actually, before we get on to the next of my random questions, I forgot that I was going to tell you about that crazy moment from that, uh, I believe it was the, that death match with Jake Chris. Yeah. It was actually the way it ended. And those that have listened to the podcast, you'll know that I, I've mentioned this one a handful of times, but still hands down one of the craziest moments I've ever seen. Four folding chairs set up near a corner. They bridge two panes of glass on them. And then Bobby, no, Jake's manager came in and he pulls out something from his pocket and my jaw drops. Lighter fluid. They light the glass on fire, go through the glass and the chairs and the fire, boom, match ends. It was insane. Craziness. Could not be me. (laughs) I will not be incorporating glass into anything that I do. Yeah, no, it it can be unpredictable. That is for sure. If you, even the ones that like breaks into the tiny, tinier pieces, you know, you roll around, that stuff gets cutting up your back and stuff. Yeah, no, nope. It's insane. Now, Next of my random questions. I would feel weird if I didn't have this one in here with the name of a show like Drinking at Moe's. I always do add this one in here. Favorite drink, whether alcoholic or non, or you can name one of each. And I, I've been adding this little bit in here. How about also least favorite? Go seconds. Is my favorite drink. I um, don't. One of my favorite beers, definitely. I, uh, growing up, I, I hated alcohol. Like I said, I was a smoker. Um, but then I uh, transitioned into drinking whiskey. Being from Texas, you know, I uh, started drinking whiskey. And then, you know, I was at my cousin's wedding where they didn't have liquor. Granted, they had a cooler full of beer. And, you know, I just grabbed... Uh, one that looked kind of interesting, and it would just happen to be a Dos Equis. So uh, ever since then, man, I, I really enjoyed it. I, that's my after-match beer. If anybody ever wants to drive, uh, buy me a drink, it's a Dos Equis. Um, favorite whiskey, just to add that in there, uh, Jim Beam Vanilla. I like I like flavor. Uh, okay. I'm not just a straight, straight shooter. I do that with tequila. And then, yeah. <laughs> uh, whiskey, you know, I'll just I'll shoot the straight uh, the vanilla. Uh, least favorite drink. I don't know, man. It, I'd probably have to go back to an alcoholic beverage because I do like most juices, sodas. I love water, like etc. So, uh, least favorite drink would probably have to be. A uh, like a Coors or like a Bud Light or something like that. Uh, I mean, nothing specific off the top of my head. So, like Coors and Bud Light, just my opinion, are terrible, terrible alcoholic beverages. Uh, so that's favorite and least favorite. Gotcha. No, Dosecki is definitely a favorite of mine. I know. If I got a beer when my wife and I went on our honeymoon, more often than not, it was Dos Equis. And, oh, boy. I'm trying to think. I know non-alcoholic for me, my wife says I have a Dr. Pepper problem. I, and this is another thing listeners to the podcast will know. I mentioned this joke I give her before. That I tell her I don't have a problem. I have it all figured out. The only problem is when I don't have any. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's but le- least favorite as far as alcohol goes for me, boy, man, we went to this place that one of my wife's cousins bartends at. 
And they got to talking about this drink, and I said that I had never had it. So it was like, okay, this one's on me, but you're drinking this now. I'm like, well, oh, fuck it if I'm not paying for it. But it, uh, Malort, it literally tastes like when it took a good half hour, 45 minutes for me to wash the taste out of my mouth because it literally tasted like I swallowed rubbing alcohol. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 another terrible drink are uh, them Hispanic drinks. You know, I got, I got a lot of Hispanic friends, nothing, uh, nothing against, you know, it's just a Hispanic drink. It's like the, the chiladas. Ah, yeah. you, get, you get the chamoy sauce and the tahini powder and they put shrimp on it, like a shrimp cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> the Bloody Marys. Uh, who drinks those? I mean, I'll admit I, I have. Oh, man. <laughs> no, man. I, Some I of the spicy about, ones are pretty good. No, I'm, I'm picky. Texture is, is everything to me. Like, the, I could probably do a little bit of spice. You know, once you start putting that thick chamoy and then you put a shrimp on it, it or like yeah, I, tomato I juice. No. Yeah, no, I, I don't mess with putting the other stuff in it, like the shrimp or nothing, but the, the basic, I'll, I mean, I have done, but that's just me. But, you know, that's the thing with, you know, drinks or food, you know, everybody has their own taste. So it's like, hey, last but not least, best advice for anybody wanting to get into wrestling. I mean, you kind of mentioned a pretty good one, a little while ago um that's that's if you're established in the wrestling like i said uh yeah ask your vets what you can improve on um hold on um, sorry uh someone was trying to get my attention um best advice in trying to get into the wrestling business is to uh understand our business uh we are entertainers we are performers a lot of fans try to get into the business solely because they are fans and they just want to do this um that's fine but don't getting into the business don't don't get in thinking that just because you're a fan and you know maybe you're athletic or saying you can do the moves because they come easy don't think that you know the business i'm yeah. three i'm three years in to my three years in from the point that i very first started training i've been consistent on the independent scene for a year and a half i don't know shit with all my accolades and how people put a lot of praise on me. I still have so much to learn and I do not know nothing about this business and performing as a whole. So getting into the business, don't ever think that a year in that you're going to just have it all. You know, uh, be a sponge. That's what my mom always told me growing up. So for anybody wanting to get into the business, be a sponge, learn everything that you can because you never know if an opportunity is going to come for you to have to wrestle a luchador mm. and the way luchadors are trained are completely different than the way uh, people in J japan are trained mm. or yep. when canada are, are training you know so yeah i get a lot of my experience from shows and a lot of people will ask like have you been training a lot of my training is shows you know because you get out there and i say it's in the field you know like whenever you have a job you know, you can go through the training or whatever, but getting in the field and learning that job through repetition, through trial and error is going to grow you and whatever you're doing. Yeah. So, my advice no. to anybody getting into the business is just to not think that you have it all just because you can get in there and, and yeah. you know. No, and you definitely brought up a lot of good points, you know, being a sponge, taking taking the learning opportunities and you know the thing that a lot of people have brought up to me that 
you know, I like, I think is very good is, you know, taking little bits from every one of those learning opportunities, especially when you're starting out to kind of mold how you're wanting to do your in-ring persona, you know, little bits with everybody. And, you know, we talked about uh, Jericho. He, I think it was one of his recent ones where he talked about, what was it? How he adapts to different styles and kind of, adapting how he goes about the match to those people like with the luchadors or the you know the match he had with Nick Gage or this person that person because you know having two different conflicting styles can you know it can mix but when you're adapting how you're doing it he, he explained it a lot better than I can but it was definitely you know you you can definitely see where he was coming from when you listen to the episode for sure and then wrestling is wrestling is timeless i mean for anybody that doesn't know the history of our wrestling it's been around since the 1930s the 1890s people were grappling you know and it, it transitioned into what we know today as professional wrestling so over a hundred years 120 years of what we have in our business, it's still ever growing. Jericho yeah. did an example of the first time he wrestled Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins wanted to hit him with three fucking suicide dives. And Jericho was like, one is enough. Like, it's a big move. Hit the big move, get the big moment, and oh my gosh. Well, Jericho, being 30, 40 years in the business, still had to learn that wrestling was progressive. And had to learn that three dives in a row could possibly mean something, you know? So it's ne never think that you just know everything. No, definitely. And that was another great example of that. Well, before we go, where can people find you social media wise? So if they don't already have their eyes on you, they can go ahead and get them there. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, Kane Carter underscore. And Kane is C. C-A-I-N-E, again, C-A-I-N-E, Carter, just regular spelling of Carter, uh, Facebook, Kane Carter, and that's really where I'm at right now, TikTok, Kane Carter underscore, so basically as soon as you type in Kane Carter, I'm the one and only, so. All fine. right, no, we'll get all that in the description of all the versions of the episode, but Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today and best of luck out there with some of those upcoming shows you're talking about that, that big Texas indie showcase. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. I love getting the opportunity to tell my story and, and just talk about stuff that we love. Man. So, oh, definitely. You, I, you know what? You're welcome back anytime. Even we can maybe talk about how that Texas Indie Showcase ends up going. Yeah, let's revamp in a couple months. I'd be down for it. Definitely. Awesome.